Good evening. I wanted to, uh, great, just wanted to get us started um, uh, and welcome everyone tonight to our fireside chat with Commissioner Rohit Chopra. Uh, I know it's probably inappropriate to say this is my favorite FTC commissioner, but here we are. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Chopra, I'm so, so thrilled to be here with you. Um, for those of you who are joining tonight, we're going to be in this great conversation for the next hour to talk about uh, a variety of things. I mean, how could we have ever planned that we would get to interview you or have a conversation during the week of the antitrust hearings that uh are facing the big tech industry. And I know a number of people who are watching tonight are going to be excited to hear what you have to say about that. So maybe before we jump in to um, your insights from yesterday's hearings, it seems like, you know, there's been quite a bit of attention over the last few years uh, about the potential harms of big tech. I mean, we've the Financial Times declared tech lash, I think, is their official word of the year in 2019. Um, we were starting to see the um, consumer scrutiny and voter scrutiny around a variety of kind of harmful technologies when the story of Cambridge Analytica broke and people started to understand that the social media platforms, for example, that they're accustomed to working in um, and with every day um, might in fact be harvesting quite a bit of data about them and um, uh, limiting the field of fair consideration of many points of view, let's say. So I wanted to see if we could open up this conversation with a little bit about your thoughts about um, an older policy that we had in the United States, the Fairness Doctrine, which really was about kind of giving a broader landscape to opinions and points of view in our media landscape. And uh, maybe that would be a place to start the conversation to kind of set the stage or the landscape of our current communications environment. Yeah, well, and thanks, Professor Noble, for doing this. We are definitely in a really unique time in history where there is a very small set of firms who have so much influence over our daily lives and in ways that more of us are questioning um, and fighting back to determine are all of these the wonderful fruits of technology can they also be weaponized to divide us to disrupt our democracy to impede our economy and i think you have raised something that is so important, which is information and communication is such a core part of an open society. And it's the lifeblood of democracy, uh, books and newspapers and music. It is really what gives us the richness of life. It allows us to fight with our words so that the best ideas can emerge. And many of us are concerned that the openness of the internet and the openness of communications are increasingly being distorted by the business models of a handful of companies. And so you talk about fairness doctrine, which is really part of the thinking around communications regulation. I really think quite a bit about unfairness doctrine, which is the core of the FTC Act. It is the core of state law and lots of other federal laws that regulate commerce. You know, it's been a hundred years since we started this concept in the U.S. of preventing and halting unfair methods of competition and unfair and deceptive practices because to protect a market that delivers a wide diversity of views, a wide diversity of products and services, we need to root out those practices. Um, and I am concerned that there is a myth that a hands-off approach is what made the US and other Western societies 
um, innovative, but in fact, there's a darker story and a much different story that I think we also have to confront. Yeah, it was actually the antitrust um, legislation that created the conditions in many ways for the current um, internet landscape that we're all experiencing. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand that history that um, the very industry that benefited the most from two th key things in my mind, which are, um, first of all, not only kind of the antitrust environment, um, breaking up, for example, AT&T and um, making a, a possible um, startups to be able to enter the marketplace. But there's also the offloading of the risk for small companies that um, have taken that, uh, let's say, public funding, public resources from a variety of different federal agencies the National Science Foundation, for example, being one that has deeply funded the tech industry. Um, many people, I think, think that all the risk for uh, the tech sector lives on Sand Hill Road, right, or among venture capitalists. But in fact, what we know is that much of the risk has been offloaded onto the public, but the dividends or the uh, return on those investments doesn't go back into the public coffers. So I'm interested in kind of your take on, um, you know, disrupting or rethinking this narrative about um, antitrust. And of course, um, you know, that that's the conversation of the day that led us up to yesterday's uh, hearings. Yeah, I, and it's something that I think we all have to think about uh, increasingly in a different way, particularly as we reflect upon our own history uh, in the U.S., uh, in Europe, uh, and in around the world, and really what set apart um, some of the benefits of democracy and open markets, um, particularly with the rise of the Chinese tech sector. It's, these questions are so important for the day. And maybe I'll respond to you by, um, you, you raised this point of, are the dividends of technological progress, um, are they accruing to the public given the risks and investment the public has made? And one of the things that I'm quite troubled by uh, is, I think, a distorted history that the those who created these trillion dollar companies or companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars, that they sort of just did it by themselves. Um, and that's just fundamentally wrong. I, I, would there be a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon had there not been the Microsoft antitrust actions? Would there be an iPhone had the U.S. taxpayers uh, not invested in some of the core research and science that powers so much of our information industry and telecommunications. There's a wonderful scholar, Mariana Matsukato, who writes about how so much of technology today actually derives from the risk taking that we all took um, as a society and as taxpayers, um, but much of the fruits of that don't necessarily, that they, 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 they're privatized. And so we need to start asking ourselves again, what was it that especially made the United States such a leader in communications and technology? And I think there were several ingredients to that. One was, as you mentioned, real investments in people, in science, technology, engineering, and communications. We made sure that no companies could own the pipes of our information flows. We made sure that when it came to the AT&Ts of the world, we, we broke them up and then sometimes required opening up their patent vaults so our entire economy could benefit from it. Um, we made sure that we eliminated certain conflicts of interest, um, 
such as in the Communications Act, where we don't allow certain commingling of activities that allow dominant players to uh, bully out smaller players that want to get in the game or take advantage of their um, unique ability to exploit data. And I think some of those principles we have been forgetting about. Um, you're right, Sand Hill Road um, plays a role, but it's not just Sand Hill Road that is fueling these innovations. Wall Street certainly does intermediate capital, but Wall Street also distorts the incentives that lead to big payoffs for all of us. And I think the net effect of that can sometimes be a distortionary to the entire economy and society. Um, one example of this is we now live in a world that is very much curated by the incentives of behavioral advertising. So behavioral advertising is a fundamental shift in how media and communications um, work. Instead of advertising uh, to an audience or a demographic, advertising targets not just a group of people, but an individual, um, a Professor Noble or myself that can track us across the internet. And that's the business model that I think can lead to many of the harms um, that we're talking about today uh, in, in the public debates. What is the role of that business model in elevating um, extreme and hateful content? What's the role of that business model um, when it comes to foreign interference in our democratic process? So I think we've got to really think hard about if we want to create, you know, 20 or 30 big tech companies, um, maybe we need to make sure that we're thinking about what was it that gave us success and what was the way in which we cultivate it. And I don't think uh, we want to follow what we hear from some in Silicon Valley, which is that, well, in order to stay competitive with Chinese tech, we got to make sure ours are, you know, they don't, maybe they don't even have to follow the law. Maybe we can just support them for our own goals. And I just think that's wrong. What really made the American technology ecosystem thrive was a diverse set of firms, big, medium, small, lots of openness and new market entry. Um, and I'm worried that we're really losing that. It's really interesting. There's a lot of things to unpack here in the things that you just mentioned. So first, I want to get to Wall Street and the financialization of um, the markets that's fueled by digital technologies. You talked about kind of our um, loss of some core values. You know, in my own work, I think of the lack of realization still for many people in the United States and around the world of democracy, of justice, of social equality, economic equality, um, I was uh, thinking as you were speaking about the mortgage crisis of 2008 and how in that crisis, one of the things that people may not realize is that people were using these very sophisticated predictive analytics, for example, to bet against Americans to figure out who would lose in order to capitalize. And in that process, it wasn't just the kind of the gamification of the markets that happened through algorithms. It was also the kind of the net effect of that was the largest wipeout, wipeout of African-American wealth in the history of the United States. So when you think about all of the gains post uh, emancipation through reconstruction, through the, uh, on the other side of the depression, through the civil rights movement, and then through the, uh, you know, modicum of, of gains uh, through the 1980s and 90s with affirmative action, you essentially could, um, you know, predict people right back into despair. Um, and so I think these things, and you know, I thought about this, I was reading your recent opinion on um, Bronx Honda, 
And one of the things that I thought was interesting about your opinion, where you wrote about um, predatory uh, car loan buying and the ways in which in this particular case, uh, a car dealership had not only blatantly discriminated, told its employees when black and Latino consumers show up, make sure you charge them more and give them a higher interest rate, but that the software and the financial tools also that get used kind of with this machine learning um, processes that train systems on old discriminatory data, those things actually become rather opaque and very difficult to intervene upon. So is this a place where the Federal Trade Commission is looking at harm? And um, if so, kind of how, how do you see uh, regulating or protecting from discrimination that happens in these kind of machine learning and gamified financial systems? Yeah, um, there's so much, I think, to learn from the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States that um, really just accelerated um, over a decade ago into how we can think about some of the problems today. One of the things that was very, very clear in many of our financial crises, but particularly the one in 2008, was um, the sheer devastation of wealth in so many neighborhoods um, across America that actually really haven't recovered, um, and the huge magnification of economic inequality, um, it, it, it's something that we need to reflect on because let's just remember how it all happened. We had a system of securitization, I mean, as you say, gamification, where one investment bank is buying up lots of subprime mortgages, issuing securities for them, and on the other hand, um, engaged in derivatives trading, betting against those borrowers. And it's almost like heads I win, tails you lose. And that's just not a system that's going to work. And we saw the consequences of that. And so when we now reflect on this new type of, um, and as you have written about very eloquently, the algorithms of oppression, I think we also need to be honest with ourselves. You know, I hear a lot of, well, it's just so good that this is all, you know, done by uh, algorithms and robots, because that just sort of takes out uh, the, the human bias and, and racism. And it, this is such a false construct, which is that algorithms I mean, these deci automated decision tools, they are reflections of um, real human life. Uh, they can build the racism into them. They can reinforce the biases that already exist while also essentially evading some of the accountability. And I think that's something that should be a huge concern across our society and sectors of the economy. And one of the things that I would like to be uh, to see being done is to use the century old um, unfairness doctrine. And unfairness doctrine is the prohibition on unfair acts or practices. And it essentially says the following, if a practice um, you know, causes injury to you know, individuals that they can't reasonably avoid um, and that there's no countervailing benefits to consumers or competition, it should be prohibited. And discrimination, even by algorithm, uh, really should be condemned by some of this. And I'm really concerned that it's not just discrimination in employment or housing or what have you, it's really the broad way in which we are participating online when some of the business models completely foreclose um, some individuals from even seeing an opportunity. I mean, I, I, I always think about these algorithms that analyze uh, resumes 
And, you know, if there is a um, black fraternity or sorority's name on it, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily get prioritized. That's just sort of the machine learning. It's drawing correlations and, and reinforcing biases. If it says uh, the, the word women in it, does that actually distort it? Even if it says women's, you know, robotics team captain, you know, these types of inferences that decide what is working and who is successful based on our existing experience, that, that actually just reinforces um, a lot of the inequities that we have. So I'm interested in using some of our core legal doctrines to advance how we condemn that and to think about ways that we can attack some of these harms um, before they even proliferate all over the world. I really appreciate you bringing that forward because we know that this relationship between humans and technology has been narrated in a very narrow way. Uh, you bring this out that it's uh, that technology will somehow be more fair rather than less, that we can manage discrimination or we can write better algorithms. Of course, this is one of the challenges that we face at UCLA in our Center for Critical Internet Inquiry is we're always trying to think about these social dimensions of technology uh, rather than what others might be doing, which is trying to figure out how to make a more perfect technology decontextualized in many ways from these kinds of histories that you're talking about that really indeed do foreclose a lot of opportunities. Um, we see, for example, babies being pulled into biometric uh, facial recognition systems so that they can get on an airplane and fly. Uh, I, I remember watching a major airline roll that out recently and, um, and being horrified. And yet the narrative is that this is so much more secure and convenient for us to use uh, technologies like facial recognition uh, we saw a few months ago the administration was looking at a technology that would allegedly um, help predict who would be uh, the next mass shooter, as if that were even possible. I mean, it's a kind of a snake oil um, environment that we're in right now where so many of these different kinds of predictive technologies are uh, indeed being weaponized against all kinds of people. And, you know, although my work is focused on people who are traditionally, um, uh, uh, you know, vulnerable, most vulnerable in systems, people of color, children, women, and girls, uh, you know, I think about who the database of potential mass shooters might be in the United States, right? And so this might be a place where people who don't see themselves as necessarily ensnared in harmful technologies might want to care about that because of course um, these profiling tools are going to reach everyone. So that's my that's my aside. I, I will say that though as a segue that you've talked about um, kind of big technology being a threat in three major ways. I've heard you talk about it being a threat to fair economic competition. Um, I've heard you talk about it being a threat to civil rights and a threat to democracy. So yesterday we had um, the CEOs from some of the major tech companies uh, who were in front of the Judiciary uh, Committee, um, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and um, uh, Microsoft was missing. So I guess they'll, they'll be around on the next round. Um, and I want to I want to know what you thought about the hearing. What jumped out to you? What wasn't said? What is it that policymakers should have asked? Um, just what's your like? You were the first person I wanted to call after the hearings were over to be like, what did you think? So I want to know what did you think? <laughs> yeah, sure. And I want to be careful as um, you know. In some cases, we have. Uh, an open investigation. These all four of those firms are subject to current um, FTC orders. 
Um, but I can speak big picture, which is that I think this was important for the public to remember that we are the ones that collectively control our markets, our laws, um, and our democracy. And I think there has been a mindset that's quite troubling, which is that um, some of our largest firms, uh, it feels that very unaccountable. I mean, there, last year, there was the FTC settlement with Facebook that was essentially $5 billion and some, some paperwork. I was very opposed to that settlement. And, and one of many reasons was that I was deeply troubled that the agency did not uh, subject Mr. Zuckerberg or Ms. Sandberg to sworn testimony, did not seek Mr. Zuckerberg's documents. Um, and in some ways, it felt like, um, based on some of the statements that were made after the announcement, that the, um, that the government essentially traded getting more money um, so that an individual did not have to uh, submit to sworn testimony. And, and I just think that's fundamentally wrong. That's not the way to ensure rule of law. Um, I'll tell you this, when the FTC goes after small firms for privacy violations, boy, do we take it all in some cases. We, we name the executives, um, we round them up, and we can't have this sort of two-tiered system. So having uh, some of the most powerful men in the world uh, be subject to public questioning by uh, elected members of Congress, I think is a good reminder that it is we as citizens uh, through our elected representatives, through our uh, law enforcement, through our policymakers, this is the process we use to structure markets, to ensure fairness and accountability, uh, and they don't have veto power over that. And I think what you heard and what I understand, I did not watch the full six hours, uh, is that many people, uh, they were asked questions about, are they in some ways um, possessing sovereign power, uh, the ability to tax, the ability to exclude, um, things that are typically done through the democratic process, um, not dictated um, you know, by, by the largest firms. So I think at a, at a base level, that was very, very important. I also think you got a little bit of a window into the intersection between how some of these firms do create massive valuations. You know, all of these firms are roughly, you know, with, with a few hundred billion in each direction, trillion dollar firms. And one of the things to continue off something you had previously said is that the incentives that are driven from our capital markets and Wall Street and Sand Hill Road are one to create extremely strong network effects such that everyone has to essentially use you and then use that power to continue to create more and more cash flow streams in ways that are very, very difficult to challenge. And whether or not that is unlawful, that will be an inquiry that is pursued. But that's, it, it, it's not necessarily always competing on who has the best product or the best service. Sometimes it's competing with who has the capital to flood the market and gain share and dominance and then ratchet up um, and monetize that power. And I think we will see the extent to which any of that violates US law. Obviously, some of the data practices have, we have found violations of law. The antitrust investigations are continuing at the federal level and the state level. Our state attorneys general uh, in the United States, I try and stay in constant communication with them, I think are going to play an outsized role in, in, in thinking through these inquiries. 
Um, but no, I, I, I'm glad to see that uh, we're moving more toward a sense that uh, you can't hide just behind your corporate banner that individuals sometimes have to answer questions um, and face accountability because I'll tell you when um, all of everyone who uh, is a normal average citizen that doesn't, you know, is not a millionaire or billionaire, when they break the law, you know, they don't get to, you know, have an army of lawyers kind of help them evade, even be questioning. Um, and, and that's what I think we have to think about with, with fair administration of justice, even when it comes to the largest firms in our economy. Yeah. You know, as you were saying this, I was thinking about how profoundly intertwined these companies are in the erosion of a, a variety of different democratic kinds of institutions. So, you know, the the questioning yesterday in the hearing was getting at, you know, different kinds of anti-democratic practices, whether it's the proliferation of um, hate speech within their platforms, um, whether it was direct violation of civil rights law, for example, in um, housing discrimination practices or other types of, um, you know, violations of the law, quite frankly, that one, uh, of course, should be held account to account for. Um, but I was thinking, you know, at a, also at a kind of a, a local level, you know, here I am, I'm a professor in the University of California system. This is one of the flagship research, public research university systems in the country. Um, like many other public democratic institutions, um, we see the shrinking um, coffers. We have seen, um, we are down in the UC system now to about a 4% contribution from taxpayers, if you can imagine that. And the conditions that that creates are precisely what you said. And I want to give this example because I think people sometimes can't really conceptualize how this matters to them. So if you have a, a public university system or a public education system, K through 12, where no tax dollars from big companies, for the most part, go into the system, then you have um, a very extractive model. On one hand, it happens by way of uh, the public having to pay higher prices, quite frankly, make deeper personal investments in their themselves and their um, the people they care about getting an education. And that happens through tuition increases, right? Because the tax base isn't there. And of course, here we are in California, uh, you know, home of Silicon Beach, right up the street is Silicon Valley. And we see almost no tax dollars in a, in a meaningful way coming into the system. So this is a this is interesting to me in terms of if we think of democratic institutions like educational systems, K through higher education, libraries, um, public media organizations, public health organizations, being the kind of public counterweight to big tech, but big tech doesn't actually, it, it act, actively works to undermine those systems by offshoring, for example, its profits. Um, also taking the cream of the crop, the best students, right? The best workers to go and work in the sector. Um, you know, this also really contributes to the kind of fundamental, to me, breakdowns in democracy and democratic institutions and things like um, accessible education, affordable education for the public. And then what happens is the new narratives come about that, well, you know, shame on you, public, for not knowing better how to tell the difference between knowledge and propaganda or disinformation, right? Um, it's kind of a public shaming of, of the users of the platforms, while at the same time, the very conditions of not educating the public are made in part by this sector. I mean, to me, this is very interesting. These are complex, important 
questions we need to be asking. Um, it also creates the conditions to come in and provide, for example, in the UC system, the entire IT backbone, which Google has done, right? So now all of the all of our email and all of our suite of services for the most part is in Microsoft and Google. So I find these things to be very fascinating. And I guess, you know, at the, you know, in our group uh, of researchers at UCLA, we're always trying to think about the paradigm that we're in and how do we shift the paradigm thinking. Um, and that, of course, has to take us to a place of thinking about remedies. How do we fix it? How, what are those solutions? So I guess I want to ask you, from your vantage point, the FTC having so much power over thinking about consumer harm and public harm and um, anti-democratic practices, uh, you know, uh, antitrust practices, all of these things being very complicated but related. Um, what do you see as maybe some of the remedies that are on your mind right now? It's a great, great um, question. I, if, I, if, you, if I may, I, you, you've sort of raised something that is close to my heart, which is the role of higher education uh, institution, public institutions in our society. Um, some of you may know that I spent several years uh, at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as uh, leading the student loan regulation and, and really butting heads with some of the bad actors in the industry, shutting down um, some of the publicly traded for-profit college chains, um, you know, major lawsuits against Sally Mae, Navient, um, a lot of them, Wells Fargo. And so it's really a reflection in some ways our student debt crisis of the fundamental disinvestment in um, how the public thinks about elevating um, the society as a whole and its people. And so I, 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 a few years ago, I wrote a paper about um, soft corruption, um, you know, in Washington, but, but in capitals across the world. And one of the things that has been a, 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 was a trend I noticed in my analysis is the increasing privatization of and weaponization of independent research. So it's now not uncommon in policy fights for um, incumbent players to finance uh, research, including at public universities, to advance a certain type of view in order to shape the debate, in order to shape uh, public policy. It is not necessarily a campaign contribution. It's not a bribe in the traditional sense, but it is a form of soft corruption that I think is a result of underinvestment um, in the public sector, whether it be our public universities, whether it be in public uh, scientific research. And the net effect is actually a a privatization of a lot of the fruits of that, um, I think, which does not necessarily serve our economy well. It doesn't serve our society well and doesn't serve our democracy well. So, you know, to answer your question, I think really the remedies um, depend on the problems we're trying to solve. And one of the things I've tried to facilitate is a lot more uh, engagement by regulators across the globe. And, and I think the Europeans have their point of view. There's, there's of course, from uh, Asia, Latin America, and Africa are also increasingly worried about some of these issues. And I think we're going to have to really come together to figure out what those solutions are. And even if we don't, we may have our country-specific solutions. But I think of them, you know, really trying to move away from the concept of monetary fines. You know, we've seen some very large fines in Europe and the US, and I think it, it's becoming clear that that is, is not effective in, in addressing the underlying incentives that motivated the misconduct or made the misconduct profitable. So, you know, if we look to remedies in, in U.S. history, I think there is a lot we can be thinking about that have correlations to today. 
So one of them, I think, is the concept of structural separations. Uh, the idea of figuring out where in certain business models there are inherent conflicts of interest. We have addressed that in telecommunications. We have addressed that um, in some aspects of banking. We have addressed that in a lot of sectors that are, that are sometimes succumb to these abuses of dominance and market power. Um, and you know, you're know you seeing in some jurisdictions around the world, rather than creating a highly complex regulatory regime that you know, in some ways the big companies have an easier time complying with, simple and clear rules of the road and bans I think are the most appropriate and let the market innovate within those boundaries. I mean, we've seen examples Outside of the U.S., um, I believe in India, they have uh, started to put into place rules that say if you're a dominant e-commerce platform, you either sell your own goods or you sell other people's goods. You don't do both. The idea being to eliminate the conflict of interest of using the data and uh, from third-party uh, market participants and platform participants in order to benefit your own business or to use it in a way to get an advantage. You obviously see this, um, you know, in other sectors and in heavy industry, um, you know, whether railroads can also own coal companies. So I think part of it is thinking through these structural separations. Um, what, should you be able to in, engage in two types of activities that might actually be a conflict? Um, should you be able, you know, a common analogy that is used is, should you be able to be the player and also the referee? So thinking about those structural separations, I think is part of a way of um, driving growth, innovation, and, and preventing um, incumbents from essentially taxing um, you know, the plumbing of our economy. Another thing that I feel really um, is an important part of all of this is the role of intellectual property. And, you know, there's a lot of debates right now uh, in the U.S. and Europe uh, with respect to the Chinese system. And in some ways, the Chinese system has a very close affiliation with its tech companies. You know, we, we do have insights about uh, relationships and between the CCP and some of it, the, the large players. And we also know that the way in which they circulate um, intellectual property throughout the economy and, and in the West, a lot of our intellectual property is vaulted up. And Intellectual property, trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, patents, all of that, that's really a decision for the public about what kind of privileges and special benefits do we want to grant companies um, in order to promote growth and innovation. And in some ways, if they're able to lock that up um, and only use it for their, themselves without really creating um, broad benefits, then maybe we need to rethink that. Or if they are abusing that intellectual property, then maybe they no longer should have exclusivity to it. Um, if you are, we, we, we remember that after opening up um, the licensing to Bell Labs generations ago, incubated a massive run of innovation in the United States to use all of that open technology um, and, and bring those benefits to all sorts of creators and innovators. The other remedy I think we're going to need to think about is open internet, um, open digital technologies. So, you know, if you think about the origins of the best of the internet, it's that no company really owns it, um, or at least didn't own it before. And it had low barriers to entry. It had open protocols in ways that created more information flows and more activity. And I think the more we can remember um, that spirit of open protocols, open technology, and open licensing and standards, I think that's another type of remedy 
that is how we might restructure uh, and fix if we find unlawful conduct. And I, I don't want, I, I think there's a, a, another really important one to me, which is the issue of individual accountability. I mentioned this up top, which is that if individuals were calling the shots to break the law, um, I think they individually need to be held accountable. Um, and there's lots of things that we have learned over time about the role of individual accountability in the boardroom, whether it's related to the financial fraud of Enron or um, in, engaged in certain price fixing or, or, or overseas bribery. I'm um, holding individuals that called the shots to break the law. Um, that just feels like an important part of regulating commerce and justice. And, and I, I also want us to, you ask about consumer harms. I want us to think about the role of take it or leave it contracts. Um, you know, the FTC has a pretty storied history of banning certain terms that are inherently one-sided or abuse, um, you know, market power or information asymmetry. And we now live in a digital world that is full of these terms and conditions. I apologize, someone's ringing my doorbell. Uh, terms and conditions that uh, really just are one-sided. They can change at any time. Um, and that just can be extractive and particularly harm um, the least fortunate or the least representative in our, represented in our society. And so that's what I think is in some ways a short list of the suite of remedies we will need to think about and really turn the page on monetary fines that are a big headline and that look good but really don't fix the problem. Yeah, I really appreciate the way that you kind of opened up those thoughts with your time at the Consumer Finance Protection Board and working on student loan debt, because it is true that um, seeing Facebook get slapped with a minor fine that was probably pocket change is extremely unsatisfying, I think, to the public. Uh, and it doesn't actually change much of the material everyday life for people who are interacting with these systems. So I guess one of the, I'm not going to put you on the spot with this. I'm just going to offer this as a provocation or a thing to think about, which is that on one hand, regulators can do things like punish predatory loan providers and um, create fines for uh, discriminatory practices. My colleague, Chris Gilliard, calls that digital redlining, right? So these kinds of digital redlining practices that can happen that get encoded into the systems. Um, you know, another set of remedies look like some type of restorative practice. So this is where you see people who are, for example, calling upon the federal government to wipe out student loan debt because it is a little bit insufficient to have a generation of people who've had to pay $100,000 for a bachelor's degree from a public university and then turn around and say, oh, we, you know, well, we're going to lower the interest rate in the future for future people, but your future is ruined. Sorry. So I think that there's like a tension between these issues of um, restoration, reparation, that needs to be considered by regulators. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I'm going to give you a, yeah. a chance. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, a incredibly important point. And one of the things that both our law and our system of commercial regulation struggle with is how do you redress uh, the those who clearly were disadvantaged by a practice, but you can't necessarily pinpoint specifically how an individual practice hurt them. You know, this is obviously one of the things I, I think about it. You, you talk about student debt and how a broken system led to that. You know, think about just how much has changed 
in in something you know a relatively uh, uh thing that we're now getting so used to in our daily lives is uh, data breaches you know we used to think about this in terms of identity theft that you know someone was kind of capturing this data so that they could you know go to a department store to open a credit card but now we're actually in such a different world where in the United States where the biggest intrusions of data, Equifax, Marriott, Anthem, this, these were not done so that people could get some money out of your bank account. This was done for the purpose of statecraft, intru democratic intrusion, disruption, cataloging dossiers about each of us for the purpose of frankly manipulation and doing us harm how do you redress that uh credit monitoring doesn't do that uh, uh and and that's just a minor piece think about the much broader harms i think also to economic opportunity and businesses how do you redress the business that got choked off before it even got off the ground because of these market structures how do you redress the firm that lost out on so much business uh, and because they were playing honestly and there was one actor that was lying and cheating? Um, we have not figured out how to do that and we, I think we need to. We need to figure out how they might be uh, in, in terms of remedies and, and the, the specific laws we have, they're, they're mixed on this. To what extent should they then have to license uh, you know, their discoveries and technologies? To what extent should they have to forfeit um, a lot of their illegal profits to the public? Um, and to what extent do we use some of that to rebuild um, some of the public's capabilities in delivering those services and, and frankly, research and insights to the broader society. So you're right, this is something that is a tough nut to crack um, in the law enforcement context, but it's something that it's, it's a real struggle for me every day when I see us doing sometimes these no money settlements, even though clearly every honest competitor, um, you know, lost out. Yeah, I mean, this is the challenge. And I think, again, when we think about our relationship between um, the tech sector and the public, it's really um, difficult because, you know, we are in a place where, for example, people have no idea what their data profile is. And they don't even know what it is entirely that's been breached. I heard a high level um, federal law enforcement person say once at a conference that in the eyes of the government, the public is, we are as individuals, our data profile. And the question is, well, what is that? And, you know, of course, I love seeing, um, you know, John Oliver, I think, um, did the great uh, uh, comedic sketch on trying to fix our credit scores and how impossible yeah. that is, right? So it's, it's fine if you've got over an 800 score, if you're anybody who doesn't have that, uh, what? So, you know, think about projects like, uh, you know, that really drive the internet, the thousands and thousands and thousands of, of data brokers and sellers that are remixing and remaking all kinds of data about us, every place we've been, the searches we do, the things we like, um, our medical records, all kind, you know, our 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 um, GPS coordinates, um, our ovulation, um, all the things, right, that go into uh, making a data profile. And I wonder if, what your thoughts might be about whether the public might be able to um, have some kind of digital amnesty. These are things that kind of th kind of things I'm thinking about and researching right now, right? Like, what if your like your uh, juvenile record might be sealed because the things you did as a kid shouldn't follow you into your adulthood? Is it plausible that we should have a, a kind of digital amnesty or a, a way to extract all of these profiles that are being made out of these systems? Um, because, you know, of course I yeah. think about this, I've got a young son and his profile is already being set. And will he be predicted into the kind of future we hope for him? We don't know. 
Yeah, you know, I I, I want to start by I'm so glad you mentioned the credit reporting system. So we're at the 50th, uh, I think 50th anniversary of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is essentially the U.S. law that's that attempted to um, really clean up a very, very underhanded industry. I mean, I think the origins of companies like Equifax was actually, you know, some investigators that would collect rumors on you and put it in a file. Um, and the concept of the Fair Credit Reporting Act was, well, let's let people look at what is being collected on them. Let's let people dispute uh, things that they don't think are right. Let's make sure that the companies use some sort of accuracy standards. I think one of the lessons of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is that it never really fundamentally addressed the business model, which is that consumers are not the customer, they are the product. Credit reporting agencies were not really selling things to consumers and families. They were selling, you know, secrets about families to businesses. And in some ways, that's also the model of today's technology industry in many ways is a huge amount of the valuation is driven by not selling things directly to consumers, but charging them for services in the forms of their data. Um, but really their main business is to sell consumer data and also importantly, consumer behavior to commercial entity entities. Their commercial entities purchase consumer behavior in the form of clicking on things, engaging on things. So that means that they have, just like the credit reporting agencies, these firms also have a business incentive to engage in these digital dragnets to collect as much information about you as they can so that they can monetize you more. Um, and I think there's some very serious questions about how that is weaponized. You know, we do know that foreign interference and manipulation is used to create racial division, um, disrupt kind of core democratic processes. And so I think you're right that we're gonna have to ask some of those hard questions, but I hope we also do it by not just saying you get to look at what people have on you and maybe you get to delete it, um, I'm a little skeptical this stuff can even be deleted in the first place, but I think looking at the core business incentives that drive the harms is just so fundamentally critical. You're absolutely right. I mean, I could talk to you for at least another hour about this, and I know we're, we're out of time, but I want to say that, um, you know, <clears throat> Commissioner Chopra, you've been such a fierce advocate for so many of the important issues in the Federal Trade Commission. I'm really thrilled that the FTC is, is thinking seriously about these kinds of issues. You know, I wrote in my book that I think that um, algorithms and artificial intelligence really will become the major human rights issue of the 21st century. And we see, of course, all the civil and human rights implications um, that stem from the things that we've been talking about today. So I just want to say thank you for giving me an opportunity to have a conversation with you today. It's really a pleasure. And um, I hope that your work will um, continue to have the kind of important impact in the world that we need. Well, thank you so much, Professor Noble. And I, I, I admire so many of you who are trying to rethink and challenge our assumptions about our relationship with large technology firms in particular and how, how we might think about that kind of future to protect ourselves, our families, our, our communities, our, our, our nations, our societies. Um, it, 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 the time is now to do it. Um, and, and a global emergency like this has to make us rethink so much of the assumptions of our markets. And, and I encourage all of you um, whether you work um, in some of these firms, whether you are trying to start a firm that uh, you want to go big, or you are advocating 
Um, we need everyone's voices in this debate. We need there to be higher levels of accountability and ultimately build toward changing um, our markets in ways that are really working for people. So thank you to you and thank you to Access Now and, and to everyone who, who is engaging and thinking, listening and speaking. Great, great. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks we so appreciate much. you.